Hey, so I'm Joseph, and this is the second part of Chapter 1 of Stuart's Calculus. I'm going to be talking about limits. So, in the previous video, if you watched it, I kind of indicated as to what a limit is, but here I'm going to give a more refined definition. So, the limit of a function, when the variable of that function, and here we're only dealing with functions of one variable, approaches a certain number, um, wherever that function ends up when it approaches that number is that limit. And that sounds kind of confusing, but th th there's a really nice notation that kind of clears that up. So, the limit of a function f of x, we know it's a limit because of this little limb notation, as x, the variable of that function, approaches some number, I'm going to call it a, is equal to the limit. That's l is the limit. And the limit is generally a number, or there are a couple other cases where it'll be something else that I'll talk about later on in this video. But, we, and we can illustrate this uh, down below. So here we got a parabola, y equals x squared, very familiar. And say we want to find the, the limit of this function y as its variable x approaches 2. Well, graphically, let's find 2 right here. Bingo. So graphically, we'd have to be able to approach along the function um, using x, 2, x equals 2, both from the bottom and from the top. And we will get the same value, and that value right here, and that value right here is 4. So we'd say that that limit is 4. And here we can see all you would have really had to do to, find, to solve this limit algebraically was, would just be to plug in 2 to the function and you'd get 4. Um, but conceptually that's how limits work. Now generally we're not going to be using limits to do things like you just saw with the parabola where we could have just plugged in um, the number that x is approaching uh, into the function to find the limit. That's not very helpful. How it, however, it is helpful in these four kind of tricky cases. So these are the four tricky cases. We've got cases where there's a hole in the function, which I'll talk about. Vertical asymptotes, I think you might be familiar with them. Um, jumps, so that's piecewise functions. and functions where x approaches infinity, and generally those are cases of where there's some sort of horizontal asymptote, or a few other cases. Um, so right now let's go check out a function that has a hole in it, and how we can kind of deal with that using limits, and how limits are very helpful to explain uh, those cases. Alright, so we've got this function here, y equals sine of x over x, and that is a great example of a function with a hole in it because when we put it and it has its hole at x equals zero because when we put zero in for x we get a zero in the denominator which makes the function undefined however it's only defined for that one point x equals zero and generally the notation for something like this would be a hole an open circle right here that my graphing software unfortunately doesn't give me but the point is, is we, we can't find y of zero that's undefined big U. However, using limits, we can find the limit as x approaches zero of y. And we and as you might have noticed from the when we were dealing with the parabola, graphically we can look at this by approaching at y of x from the po negative x side and the positive x side, which can be written in as such. Negative side we're approaching that, uh, that limit on the function from the negative x, and then positive sign up here, up here, from the positive side, um, so I think so we can, look at, we're running along, the, running along the function from the negative side, and we get one value running along the negative side, and we get the, the same value. So we can see that that limit there does exist, and we can solve for it. And I'll prove it numerically using this handy Excel sheet. Alright, so I've written in g of x as y equals sine x over x, same function. And so let's get really, really close to x equals zero from both the positive side over here, which will be this little x, and the negative side over here, which will be this x, um, to actually numerically solve that limit and also prove that it exists. Alright, so using a step size of 0.1 
here, we're getting really close to zero from the positive side going down from one towards zero, and we're using the same step side but from st step size, but from the negative side starting at negative one going to negative point one. And g of x, the function sine over sine x over x, gets to one. Now this means this one doesn't mean that the it, we can say is the limit. The limit is 1. If we were to solve that limit algebraically, which I'll show you how to do later in the chapter, we would find that it is 1. However, at point, it's not 1 at point 1, it's 1 at 0. However, it's so close to 1 at point 1 that XL, which rounds to something like the trillionth, thinks that it's 1 because it's that close. So, that goes to show you how kind of useful it is to look at limits in this way, just make the numbers approach whatever you're trying to get to um, with really small increments, You'll th th that number will come out sooner than reaching zero or whatever you're approaching um, more, more often than not. So we have covered the first of the tricky case, holes. Now we're on to the second one, cases where we have vertical asymptotes. Um, let me show you a graphical example of that to maybe jog your memory. All right, so the function y equals 1 over x squared is an example of an asymptotic, vertical asymptotic function because the function from both the negative side and the positive x side, it x gets really, really, really close to 0, and it, it, it keeps approaching the, that vertical line, x equals 0, but y still gets infinitely large as x gets infinitely closer to zero. And I'll zoom out here a little bit so you, I can show you. Look, it looks like it gets close to that vertical line, but it never really does, and y continues to get huge. So, kind of similar with, to with the uh, cases of holes, we can't, we, we never will be able to have the function y of zero. That, that'll always be undefined. And numerically we can look at that and say well you'd have a zero in the denominator at y of zero so yeah it would be undefined however once again we can try to find the limit as x approaches zero of one from the negative and the positive side so going from the negative we go like this but wait this will get big forever y will get infinitely large same same story from over here. Y will keep getting will keep getting infinitely huge. So we can say this with limits, and conceptually this is very helpful. We can say that the limit as x approaches zero of of y is equal to infinity, and infinity is this placeholder for this super largest number ever that you can imagine. Um, it's kind of a conceptual placeholder just to say that y will continue to get huge as x continues to approach zero from both sides. Numerically, we can also try to, we can also see this limit with this asymptotic function in the same way as we did previously with the whole using this Excel spreadsheet and using num like making the numbers approach zero from both the positive and the negative sign, where h of x is the function one over x squared. So we can see as I make one approach zero by tenths and negative one approach zero by tenths, uh, h of x continues to grow on both sides and grow by a lot. It's getting up to a hundred here. However, you might say, well, we just haven't got close enough to reach a certain limit. Well. Sure, why don't we try to use even smaller step sizes? And bear in mind that with this equation over here, XL, it, or it, was, it got so close to a certain limit that XL was rounding it up to that limit. Just bear that in mind. So here, let's try that using hundredths. Okay, so even we, when we approach zero by hundredths, getting as close as 0.04 to zero, negative 0.04, H of X continues to grow by a lot. And so, that leads us to believe that we can keep subdividing x and subdividing x and making it get closer to zero and that will do nothing but make h of x grow. And so we see that the limit is infinity, conceptually, and that kind of makes sense. And that is one reason why limits are useful, because we can describe functions that uh, behave like that, that go up to infinity or go across to infinity, or um, something of that sort. 
All right, so now we have seen the tricky case of vertical asymptotes. Now let's look at jumps. And jumps are where literally the function goes somewhere and then jumps to another place. And we're going to look at a piecewise function to illustrate this, which you might, may or may not be familiar with. Regardless, I'll give you a little refresher. And then y is going to be equal to 1 only when x is between 1 and 2. And then y is going to be equal to 2, but only when x is between 2 and 5. So that is the function x. And so we can find that there is a value for y for every single value of x between 0 and 5. However, what if we try to take the limit as x approaches 2 here? That would look like the limit as x approaches 2 of y. Well, let's try to approach 2 from the negative side. Go like that. And we will get, from the negative side, we get that that limit's 0. But from the positive side, we will get, from here, that that limit is 2. So the limit from the negative side is not equal to the limit from the positive side. That means that the limit as x approaches 2, when we get two differences like that, when we approach the limit from the po negative and the positive side, when, the, when those are not equal, we will get that the limit does not exist. And this little abbreviation here, the AP folks accept that, and you can write that for limits that do not exist. Now, the last tricky case we're going to deal with is when x approaches infinity. So we're going back to this same graph here that we were looking at earlier, the graph of y equals 1 over x squared. And, however, we're not going to make x approach 0. We're going to try to find the limit as x approaches infinity of this graph y. And so infinity here similarly to when we were talking about the vertical asymptote. Um, infinity is just the largest number you can think of. And so it means when x goes to the right, as x just keeps going right like this forever. Now it looks like the graph reaches 0, but it never actually gets to 0. However, we can still find this limit right here. And the limit, it, it, the place where the graph will never get below, is going to be 0. And uh, you can take my word for this, but I actually wouldn't, I can because I can show it to you and prove it to you um, with an Excel sheet. So we're back to h of x, which is 1 over x squared. And instead of get making x approach 0, since x is approaching infinity, I'm just going to make x really, really, really huge, like this. Um, and I'm going to use, at first, step sizes of 1. All right, so we got all the way out to x equals 14. And we don't need to do this from the negative side. You can't imp approach if infinity from the negative side, because where would you start? You'd start at infinity, and we don't really know exactly where that is. And we see that the function just gets down to 0 0.01. And now that's really close to 0, and Excel likes to round things. And so because it's 0 0.01 so consistently, that that limit there is 0. So and I mean it makes sense graphically. Uh, the limit is as x approaches infinity here is zero because we have a horizontal asymptote as you might remember from pre-calc where the function gets really really close to zero but never goes below it and never actually reaches it. So that's something to pay attention to and to keep in mind are these asymptotes when you've got x approaching infinity or you could actually make the limit approach negative infinity where it looks like this approaches negative infinity, and that would be just the opposite of going to the left, where we're making the function go this way, and since we've got one big ol' horizontal asymptote, this limit is also zero, and I could show you that with the Excel spreadsheet, but it'll end up doing the exact same thing. So this whole time I've been talking a lot about continuity, and I'm going to give a kind of vague definition here. And continuity in a function, a continuous function, is one that doesn't really have any breaks in it, where there's a value um, of f for every value x on a certain interval. Um, and that's a great sort of way to think about a continuous function. However, using limits, we have three really nice conditions 
of what makes a continuous function. And it's really good to know these three conditions because the AP um, for calc AB and calc BC um, kind of likes to play around with them and ask you, well, why exactly isn't this function continuous? And you're expected to answer that in terms of limits. All right, so here are the conditions of a continuous function in terms of limits. So first, we've got that for all values a, and that's just any number on the x-axis, for all numbers a, um, f of a exists. So that means that every single value in the function has to exist, and a counterexample of this, of a function that is discontinuous um, because of, this would be the one that we looked at earlier with the whole, all functions with the little whole. Because um, if you got a whole here, that means that in the, even in this particular case, f of 0 does not exist, so this function is not continuous because we've got a little hole there. Um, now this for the second condition, now we're getting more into limits. Um, the limit as x equals, as, as x approaches a of f of x exists. That means that a limit needs to exist for every value of a um, on the function. And an example of, the, of a function that is discontinuous um, for the second reason would be the piecewise function or a function with a jump in it like this one. So the limit as um, x approaches 2 does not exist right here. The limit as x, x approaches 2, that limit doesn't exist because we've got the two different values here when you approach the limit from the positive and the negative side. So this function, the jump function, is discontinuous for all values, or is, is, yes, is discontinuous because the limit doesn't exist for all values of x or all values of a, as the definition states. And now this third definition is something that we haven't really looked at yet, um, and it's a little trickier. It's when the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals f of a. So this means that the value of the function at a needs to be equal to the limit as x approaches a of that function. Now that seems a little weird to be something that we have to state. How would it be possible for the limit not to equal the value of the function at a? Well, let's go back and consider the function with the whole. y equals y equals sine y equals sine x over x. And so we don't have a value at x equals 0. But what if I were to write it, rewrite the function as follows, as f of x equals sine, sine x over x only when x doesn't equal 0, but then make it equal to negative 2.5 only when x equals 0. And so that would mean that we'd have a little dot right there. And so this would make it so that the function has a value for all values of x. However, the limit as x approaches 0 here is this value, where that, where that hole is and where that line ends up being, is that value. However, the value of the function is negative 2.5. So the limit doesn't equal the function, and therefore this f of x is discontinuous based on um, that third definition and condition for continuity. So far, I've showed you a bunch of different ways of kind of conceptualizing and looking at limits and some re useful applications for limits. However, a lot of the time on the AP and just in other math classes and when you're doing different kinds of math, you're going to need to be able to solve limits algebraically. And now I'm going to give you three pretty good methods for doing this. All right, so here are your three methods for solving limits. It's actually four, but the four is a super secret one that we're not going to learn until in a couple of videos once you've gained some more calculus skills. But first, and I think this is the best, uh, and it's the most like reliable, is going to be just graph it. Just graph the function that you're trying to find, look at it, and you'll probably pretty easily, if there's a jump or if there's a, some sort of vertical asymptote, you'll pretty easily be able to figure out what the limit is, or if there's a discontinuity. Second is the plug-in method, and this works for functions like the parabola, where if we have as the limit as x approaches 2 of a parabola, will vary, we'll, you'll just be able to plug 2 in for that function. Now the third, this is one of my own naming, it's called the whittle down, and it's really just a derivative of the plug-in method. Um, and I'll show you how to do that right here. So let's say we're trying to find 
the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus x minus 2 over x minus 2. Now, this isn't a function that I know how to graph. This is not a very standard function, so I can't graph it. And also, if we plug 2 in for this function, we'll get a 0 in the denominator, and that'll make the function undefined, and we don't know how to solve a limit like that. However, we can manipulate the variables and do some algebra and change stuff around so that we can eventually plug this 2 in and use the plug-in method. So really, the whittle-down method is a it's algebra plus the plug-in method, but here we go. So we can rewrite this as by foiling, by foiling, foiling this second degree polynomial as um, x minus 2 quantity times x plus 1 quantity over x minus 2. And lo and behold, these terms cancel out, and what we're left with is something very manageable. The limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 1, and now we can just use the, use the plug-in method. Put 2 in there, and that limit will equal 3. There we go. So that, in a nutshell, is the whittle-down method. So in addition to being able to tell us some cool things about some weird sort of functions and graphs, limits are also interesting interesting and in that they kind of yield some nice theorems and the most important of which and the one that you're going to be using the most especially on the AP exams and probably in your other calc courses and also it's just really interesting is the intermediate value theorem and the intermediate value theorem tells us three things all right so these are the three things that the intermediate value theorem tells us and uh, I'll go through them step by step on a graph so the first first condition is that some function f of x is continuous on a domain a and B. That means, and these little brackets for if you don't remember, means that it's inclusive. That means that the function has it has a value at both A and B. So let's draw that out here. Big old function. So we've got the x-axis. We've got A, and we've got B, and we've got some sort of function that probably looks like that. All right. There's our function. Now two we have that n, some number on the y-axis, is between f of a and f of b, where f of a is not equal to f of b. So that means, straight off the bat, that the intermediate value theorem does not apply to graphs that look like this, where you can, from the endpoints, you can have a flat horizontal line between them. So you can't have a parabola looking like that and use the intermediate value theorem on it. But I will illustrate this other condition here. So let's say we have some value f of a, and we have some value f of b. So that means that the function will start off there at f at f of a is f of a right there, and it'll loop around like this to b. So the function is going to look, can be anything, it can be anything in the middle, but it'll look like this and it's continuous. And then we've got a value n, any random number n between f of a and f of b, and it'll look like this. And so the third condition is that there's a number c on the x-axis that exists between this interval, and this means, these open brackets mean that it cannot be either a or b. c cannot be a or b, but it has to be in between them. And the intermediate value theorem tells us that for any number c, that will correspond to some number n, like that. And so that's pretty useful, because that tells us, and it'll tell us a lot of interesting things when we start talking about velocity and acceleration and displacement, because it means that if you have a car that's moving, say, starting off at velocity uh, 10 at time 0, and it ends up at velocity 30 at time 5, somewhere between time 0 and 5, it will have to pass through velocity 15. And that's pretty helpful for a lot of different reasons. But um, in any case, this has been Limits with Joseph from Stewart's Calculus, uh, and I hope you guys math hard. <laughs>